Thrilled to have you. We have in the house with us today, folks, Jeff McJunkin, who we all know as Wizard, Sands Instructor, owner, operator, member of Rogue InfoSec, and BHIS family member. Love having you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. It's like a Red Hot Chili Peppers video behind you there on the walls. That's fantastic. <laughs> I love yeah. it. Yeah, it makes for a nice backdrop. Yeah. It's- it's so beautiful. Yeah, it really is. I hear it came from DEF CON 27. I think, I think that's the official banner that was up there. So it seems to have ended up with me somehow. And I wonder I, how I'm that not taking any in place. questions on that subject. <laughs> right. All right. All right. So uh, we're going to... Uh, a couple minutes, or do you want to dive in? You know what? Why don't we just let you dive in? Why not? All right. All right. I, mean, so I, I don't know about, about that. that. I don't know. Well, I, wait a minute. Mr. Moderator wants to banter. Okay. Let's banter for one minute and 30 seconds. Ready? Go, Mr. Moderator. <laughs> we oh, got people for this set. question <laughs> earlier, Jeff. Now, it's a really tough question. We're kind of hoping to break you open a little bit here. What All is right. your favorite flavor of Doritos? I actually... I admit I, I I turned pure teenager along with my wife a little recently and had pizza and uh, the nacho cheese Doritos uh, recently oh. again. Like, oh, yep, yeah, they're still still damn good. How many flavors are there? I I was only aware of three. That's uh, whole have, 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 Saturday, I heard this morning. All right, never mind. Lots, lots never of mind. flavors, right? I need to go uh, to look the... up Japanese Doritos flavors if you want some bonus. Oh, I bet those are interesting. <laughs> There's so some if, interesting Japanese candies. Like there's Twix. Twix comes in different, totally different things you wouldn't expect from Japan. I don't know what they are, but I remember seeing them in one of the grocery stores around here. So the other good, cool thing that, that a lot of you don't know about Jeff is he is he is the online forum enabler du jour, right? Whenever you see Jeff like hanging out uh, on a Discord channel, if you see Jeff hanging out in uh, – any any online forum, Twitters, whatever, you're going to see Jeff enabling people, and he's amazing at it. He will just, yeah, it, it's a special talent, special talent. We call him a, a helper. Some people might call him a rustler almost here at the uh, Wild West Hack and Fest space. But, uh, we, we I, I was happy to, to look down the list of the different roles, and there's the Huckleberry role. That is just me. It's just yep, me. I'm the only right. one without you're the yeah, Jeff has a special role. I was about to say that a special role uh, uh, this week. So that's awesome. Well, we have now wasted the two minutes, which is fantastic. <laughs> so spinning it over to Mr. Jeff McJunkin, take it away, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, Jared, sure. Have a great time. Will do. So the topic today: bypass and antivirus. Because once you understand that there's only so many methods antivirus is using, it's not monitoring everything, right? Then we can understand those methods and attack those specific methods. So let's go ahead and dive right in. There are three major methods that antivirus has for detecting and then blocking malware. We'll go over each of them, talk about some fundamental limitations, some of the terminology involved. Of course, there has to be a live demo for bypass and AV, lots and lots of references throughout, and then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. So there are three major tools that antivirus has. I've seen antivirus, anti-malware, endpoint detection and response as well. Look, they like to have a different name for it with EDR, and a lot of it's about more detective controls, but would you say that your EDR agent is pro or anti-virus, right? It's still antivirus. It still has the same fundamental engines. So the main method that we like to make fun of, especially myself, is those static detections, right? Antivirus is more than just looking for bad strings. But static detections are essentially looking for bad strings, right? Searching each EXE, each DLL, and many other file types as well upon load for some bad strings. That's kind of the the, the go-to response for most antivirus today still, right? Uh, Another thing that they can do, and many of them do, nearly all, is hook certain API calls at runtime. Say, hey, if the source process is PowerShell, and it's calling the read process memory function with the target of LSAS, that's some weird and suspicious behavior, so we should probably stop that. We'll also talk about the anti-malware scanning interface, have some slides on that, talk a little bit about, um, again, more of those NTDLL style hooks, 
And those hooks, by the way, because they're more prone to false positives, you see that antivirus uses them, frankly, a lot less. And finally, we have dynamic detection, which really just means it boils down to run the sample in a VM, essentially. And for a little while, before actually starting it, and see if it does something bad. If it does something known bad, then mark it as bad. But that's the emulation, and we'll talk about that one as well. All right. Oh, by the way, I am monitoring as we go the Discord channel. So if you want to say hello or ask questions as we go. Oh, excellent. Uh, the, the shirt I'm wearing, which is one of my favorites, it's a uh, Pro Metasploit, open source is awesome. Apparently, Egypt helped design that. So thank you, Egypt, by the way. All right. As far as strings go, all of those detections, when they're involving strings, isn't necessarily a pure yes or no. All right, it's giving a badness score to the sample. And based on the resulting badness score, I have some threshold whether to call it bad or not. And I say that, but there are some strings that have the huge, huge plus badness score. Invoke dash mimicats is so bad that we have to stop it everywhere. Like if I switch out to PowerShell, right, I can do any arbitrary string here, and it just shows the string, right? Hooray, PowerShell usage. But if my string is invoke dash mimicats, right, is this string inherently malicious? No. But it's marked as malicious, right? This script contains malicious content that's been blocked by your antivirus software. That there is the anti-malware scanning interface. Otherwise, you just see that PowerShell is doing something. With AMZ, well, we have a little bit more on it, but it'll send that string just before it's actually run to whatever registered antivirus is running. Right. And BB Hacky mentions it still makes me laugh that Delpy is an indicator of malice, right? Copyright Benjamin Delpy is one of my favorite strings to, to point out. And we'll see some more about that. And a lot of people immediately bring up, well, this next gen antivirus, right? It has machine learning and artificial intelligence. And it turns out when you look under the hood of AI and machine learning, it's giving a whole bunch of samples, right? A pile of good and a pile of bad. And says, okay. Find strings, essentially, find parts of these bad binaries that aren't in any of the good binaries, find patterns. This might be actual code patterns, but those you know, could change upon recompile. Strings, though, are going to always result being there. So uh, there's an article, a great one, about silence uh, being tricked that malware was goodware by appending strings from online gaming. And I have literally run recursive uh, strings.exe against my Steam library on a Windows machine, and then append that to the end of an exe that's marked as bad, and it turns out it gets a heck of a lot less signatures by AV at that point, right? Because we're we're stacking the deck in good strings, right? Whether it's uh, uh what's the Fortnite with all the little dances and such. So turns out if you dance, uh, have those strings in the middle, right? That that really helps your malware be considered goodware. All right. So I did want to point out AMZ in particular, right? Otherwise, you don't get a whole lot of view into PowerShell, JavaScript, VBScript, Office macros, et cetera. And I have a different little thing on this, but if your AV product doesn't support AMZ in the year 2020, move away from that AV product, right? There's different uh, trackers of who's who supports it? My, my personal favorite that I've been working with is the Who AMZ uh, GitHub page, or up on screen now. And like, again, if your AV vendor doesn't support AMZ, they are essentially giving up on anything inside of any runtime environment. Especially since uh, newer versions of .NET support AMZ for just .NET objects directly, which is really really powerful. All right, so. If your AV vendor isn't on this list, leave that vendor. Now, I still think AV as an industry is doomed, and I'll have a whole lot more to back this up, but kind of as a first step, if it doesn't support AMZ, go away, right? Do not give them your money, all right? Sorry, CrowdStrike, all right. Fundamental limitations of AV, it doesn't uh, track every single API call, right? We have a trade-off here of, I, I, I hate the false narrative of security versus usability, but there is some here. If you're hooking every single API call that every single process makes, you're going to slow down the system. So hooking API calls and emulating the EXE or DLL for a long time, 
that's going to slow things down. And the antivirus from a market perspective cannot think, oh, I'm going to slow down this environment too much, right? People will push back. People won't buy your product anymore. You just can't have, I installed Symantec and now my computer is slow as an acceptable outcome, right? And market demands tend to win. So financial incentives really, really matter. And false positives are bad. And I have a little bit of a uh, viewpoint for this, but let's first talk about this bots fighting bots. And I, I love that um, I, I happen to come across both of these pretty recently. On the right corner, as the red bot is fuzzing the Windows API for AV evasion. We have the, the links inside as well. And by the way, I see people are, are sharing the uh, the URLs as they're going through. The slides are should be tracked, uh, posted to T1 slides. And I have a, a URL with these exact slides that I'll share at the end. It's an, one more bit.ly link, as I always do. So I, I love the approach on the right, because I said it's kind of like the antivirus runs your sample in a VM, but it's not a real VM, right? They're not installing VMware in Windows 10 or whatever your environment is. Uh, oh, slides aren't there yet. Here, let me just mid-talk share my slide link. Bypassing AV, bit.ly slash bypassing AV. Here, let me uh, slideify that. There we go. So antivirus is running your sample in a emulated environment, not real Windows 10. So it doesn't have like all of the functionality of Windows 10. It might pretend to have like one browser installed. And a lot of malware focuses on detecting. <laughs> I see people joining the, that link now, which is funny, a different window. So, it, so a lot of malware focuses on detecting that environment and then share or Sorry, I was distracted by uh, too many discords going on at the same time. Detect that fake environment and then display different behavior at that moment, right? So then going on the other side of things, people also run full VMs like a Cuckoo Sandbox. And we have on the left corner, right, the, the blue bot in this case doing the fake sandbox artifacts. Pretend to be a real machine by having some real user data in there, right? Have more than one core or two cores and two gigs of RAM, right? appear to be a more realistic machine, right? So we have this back and forth, but the problem is at the moment of detonation, at the moment of your sample uh, touching the destination machine, you get to fight last and you get to examine the heck out of the defending bot. All right. In a perfect world, we'd have good signs that something is known good or known bad, but categorization theory exists Right. And anytime you classify something. So in the background here on the left, yeah, I got the fancy little pointer. Right. Everything inside the square is a negative, except for anything inside the circle is a positive. Right. Then we have the, the left and right side and we have the different categorizations there. So everything that's in the background square should not be considered uh, malicious. Right. And we have the categorization again on the left half. So if it's inside the circle, and it's marked as malicious, then it's a true positive, right? But we also have things that are marked as malicious, but aren't actually malicious. We call that a false positive, right? In a perfect world, we have very clear signatures saying this is malicious or not. But as it turns out, with test results, like going back to normal testing theory, you might have the result of a negative test might be somewhat regularly on this line right here, this slope right here. Right. The problem is there's significant overlap between positive results where the lower side of positive results kind of overlaps with the upper side of negative results. So there's a lot of wiggle room, a lot of gray area here. Or to put it uh, more in the infosec world, there's a heck of a lot of suspicious behavior by actually legit software. Right. So if you put that line in the middle and say, okay, if you say that right here, this little spot right here, anything higher than that, we're going to mark as actually bad, you're accepting a lot of false positives. In fact, you're accepting an equal amount of false negatives and false positives. And we have the, of course, definition there, right? False positive, notepad.exe is being marked as malicious, right? False negative, minicats.exe is good to go, right? False positives cost more. Therefore, you can tune this. You can choose the line in the sand, right? This dotted red line in this example of where to mark things as good or bad. 
But you're having a trade off here by having fewer false positives, you're accepting more false negatives. Right. And that's a really, really big difference. I don't want to get like all into the graph theory, but graphs are fun. And, and we, I have in the slide notes the actual uh, YouTube uh, link for this one. I think it's a great resource. Right. So this really encourages brittle signatures. Invoke Dash Mimikatz is my favorite example because it's marked as so malicious that PowerShell itself, right? Invoke Dash Mimikatz anywhere is marked as bad, right? And it, it turns out people have found this in a few ways. People have changed their wireless access point to invoke dash mimikatz.ps1. And as it turns out, Windows 10 behind the scenes calls out to NetSH, including invoke mimikatz.ps1. All right, and therefore Windows marks Windows as malicious. Or uh, get clone when your computer name is invoked dash mimicat doesn't work, right? Copyright Benjamin Delpi. You don't have much in the way of false positives. Now, these false positives can be hilarious, right? Invoke dash mimicats, but there's all sorts of weird behavior by actually legitimate software, right? Including things like accessing LSAS, which there's a heck of a lot more to Mimikatz. Believe me, there's a lot more to Mimikatz than gathering plain text passwords, but it is the most well known flagship feature, right? So I love Defender Check. And I just found out today that, who was it? As I go to a, another monitor, that uh, Daddy Kokoman made a Python implementation of the same idea. But let's go ahead and dive into. Defender check. So I have here my command prompt, and there's defender check. All right. Defender check takes any arbitrary binary and submits it to Windows Defender and gets back the response. So far, nothing too exciting. But if it's marked as malicious, it will start taking off chunks of the binary and taking off a half of it at a time and narrowing down what is the exact sequence of bytes that gets marked as malicious. So first of all, let me turn off real-time protection because that's the thing that, uh, well, was flaggy invoked dash mimikatz as bad. So I'll run it against mimikatz.exe as one example, right? I'll do more as well, but mimikatz.exe, right? It's taking half at a time. It's being marked as malicious and we see the series of bytes, right? This is the standard hex view. We have the offset, the, the hex and then the ASCII representation here. And it takes a little bit of reading because we have Unicode stuff going on. And minicats underscore do local is based on my own testing separately, exactly what's being flagged. So if we could change out minicats do local, does the function name, does the help text actually affect the binaries running? No, not at all. And there are plenty of builds even on GitHub now where uh, they will take the latest minicats source and swap out strings, right? If there is a invoke dash mimikatz comment inside of a PS1 file, is it possible to write a signature that parses comments? Yeah, of course. But what if we did something, well, do comments affect the execution of, of the program, right? By definition, they do not. So if I strip comments, do you turn to get a lower response rate? It turns out you do. And I'm going to reference something here. Uh, Carrie Roberts has an evergreen post here, right? On somewhere around here. All right. Bypassing Defender Metasploit. All right. I'm going to give her more. Oh, sorry. To run Mimikatz, rather. How to run antivirus, to, uh, how to uh, bypass antivirus to run Mimikatz. And this is an evergreen post. It was. Originally posted January 2017, Carrie's still very active and still very involved with BHIS as well, along with being with some Fortune 100, uh, Fortune 1 company, we won't say which. But she has at the end here all the stuff she did, right? Getting rid of comments and the detection rate goes down significantly, right? Changing invoke dash mimi cat to invoke mimi dogs and the detection rate goes down from originally 19 out of 54 to 8 out of 54. So Look, just to be clear, am I accusing at the time um, 11 AV vendors of just flagging the string invoke dash mimicats and kind of quitting the job early? Yes, yes, that's exactly what I'm accusing them of. And we'll see that even today, right, as this demo continues, so I'm not stopping with what uh, Carrie has here. But at the end, she goes through getting rid of like comments and then spaces before comments and comments at the end. 
And she said she did a little bit of experimentation and found out it doesn't like the word dump creds. So let's just change it to dump cred singular. So we have two AV vendors left, ESET and Rising. You probably don't use either one of them. And I don't think either one of them supports AMZ. Ugh, we're at a tough time here. So she has this whole script puts together. She changes, uh, what, argument pointer to not today, pal. And my personal favorite, call DLL main SC1 to this is not the string you are looking for. All right. I love that one. Oh, thank you, Adam, for being the link guy for me. And at the time, that was 0 out of 54. Now, time has passed. And now, if I go to the original invoke dash all right, as of, well, last time it was scanned, 40 out of 59 AV vendors were flagging invoke dash as it was originally downloaded from GitHub. So time out. That means, what, 19 AV vendors suck at their job and shouldn't exist, right? I wouldn't like name names and blame, but this list, and honestly, I'm not giving a whole lot of extra credit to Silence and CrowdStrike, et cetera, for saying, no, no, we don't support PS1 files, so we don't count. All right. So let's uh, take the Mimi Dogs version. This is the carry version, right? Invoke Mimi Cats underscore carry is how I originally named it. And as of now, well, as of last time it was scanned, I could resubmit. 35 AV vendors, which is less still, but there are other strings going on. So let's apply defender check to invoke mimicats underscore carry, all right? That's taking all of the changes she made, and we'll still see an exact offset. But then I'm going to do a trick, one weird trick for bypassing the AV for PowerShell, because PowerShell, right, it's not compiled language, it's dynamic, it's text-based. We have a 256 byte range this could be. And that's a little bit more problematic. Now that based on, on how Defender Check and the Python implementation work, the bad string tends to be at the end, but let's do a fun little trick. I'll take the invoke mimicats underscore carry and I'll do a replacement. Replace dollar sign, replace the end of the line with 256 space characters. I, I find it hilarious that this works so well. And then I'll save it as invoke minicats carry with spaces. All right, now I can rerun defender check. And this is replacing the work that, that, that she did to find dump creds, for example, was being known as suspicious. All right, one weird trick, antivirus vendors really hate me. Oh, I've had AV vendors in class before and we talk pretty kindly about these things. So. Now notice, because I have all these hex two zero spaces, I'm pretty darn sure where the bad stuff is. We have uh, functions, add member, no property, name, virtual protect. Out of this whole thing, virtual protect is the only string that's a little bit unusual and weird. All right, so we could just change, all right, search for, what did I just say? Dollar virtual protect, turn off regex matching. Do, 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 do. There we go. Win32 functions, virtual protect. Let's change virtual protect to virtual plus protect. Does this have the, have the same effect? Yeah, of course. It's just two strings concatenated. But is it going to be flagged as now malicious? Right? So we're getting closer and closer to what I tweeted about some time ago, and I'll have the, the screenshot and the actual link. But it's changing two more of these things. I could rerun this, and now I get the next signature, because it's not just one signature for known bad. They tend to have a few different signatures throughout. And notice that I'm only bypassing Defender here, or at least only focusing on Defender. We could replace the same idea, just as long as it just supports AMSI, which, to be fair, uh, Defender Check does depend on. All right, so we, we rerun, and now we see write process memory is the new bad string. So let me search for write process memory, all right? And there's the add function, write process memory. So how about write plus process memory, all right? This is the process that you'll be going through, changing stupid string-based signatures, stupid brittle signatures. Maybe I shouldn't say stupid, but at least brittle signatures, because this isn't affecting the runtime. But now I've bypassed two different signatures, and we have the last one, because as of when I tweeted uh, those two changes, that was enough. But now we have exe args sec urlsa, exe args 
equal sec URL SA. All right, how about let's change sec URL to sec plus RLSA and log on passwords to log on P plus passwords because I wanted to curse at some point, All right? I usually use Visual Studio Code, I swear. Oh, hi, Carrie. Great to have you in here. And what's left? It turns out I've uh, pre-baked this one. Then we have Mimikatz tweet. This is the one I tweeted about with those two changes. And then as of today, I did the tweet too, which is just that last little change. All right? Where did I get defender check from? Yeah, you can. I'll have the, the, the full link in there. But if you have defender check, all right, that interpreter. And there is a Daddy Kokoman gist which is on screen now and shared in Discord now, which is a Python implementation of the same idea. And it works just fine too. In fact, it has a couple of nice little features. It came out today. Yeah, he, he posted about it at 10.58. So here's running Pi Defender check, and we have the same idea. I'll run against the carry version, for example. The thing that's nicer about this is it actually has the right offsets. All right, this says offset 0, 0, 0, 0. It's not quite how it works. Thank you, Japanese characters that I don't quite recognize. Sorry. All right. And because I have all those extra spaces, it does take a little bit longer to take half at a time, but it works just fine. All right. So I can do more kind of ad hoc demos as we go, but I also want to make it through our slides and our time allotted. And I have a little tweet from uh, Mick Douglas kind of replying to me because, gosh, that's embarrassing. In fact, I have I have one more. Let me show you. One more, far more embarrassing. So Tavis Ormandy made a CTF tool. It's not capture the flag tool. It's for taking advantage of a really old technology inside of Windows, and it was for privilege escalation. But if you run Defender Check against the payload that Tavis Ormandy includes, you see that there's this string. C users Tavis Ormandy documents project CTF tool payload 64.pdb. If you search about PDB strings, they're essentially debug information strings that Visual Studio compiles along with the binary. It's not necessary to have these PDB strings. You can turn it off. And in fact, there's another utility called, it's not in this one. Well, I should have had only one up. All right, peupdate.exe, which I have the, the link to, which lets you strip those. And you can also just open the binary in a hex editor. All right, here's payload 64, part of the CTF tool that Tavis Ormandy introduces. So I can search for this Tavis space Ormandy and just replace it. And this is what, exactly what I did before. All right, company name, Tavis Ormandy, not that one, please. Find next. Find next, please. I think, do I not want Unicode string? Do I want? All right. So let me fall back to, I forget how I'm control effing wrong, but PE update does let you get rid of PDB strings. So if I want to do my little false flag operation, I could point to, C, uh, let, me, let me copy out. Copy C bin payload 64, the original binary. I'm going to call it false flag dot DLL. All right. This is just a copy so I can show the before and after. Let me run PE update against this false flag. Let me update. Make sure I have the order right. Options, then input file. Option, hey, John Strand is here. All right. How about C colon backslash users slash John MF Strand slash documents slash evil slash evil dot PDB. This is the new string, right? It's changed from Tavis Ormandy to John Strand, John MF Strand, right? Now I can run defender check against my new version, my false flag operation, and hey, it's good to go. And it turns out if you look at uh, virus total before and after, let me open up two new tabs because I need more tabs definitely. I'll show the original payload 64. which is flagged by a lot of things, and you think, oh, 
I feel good about our industry. All right. The only thing I changed was blaming John Strand. So let's upload our false flag.dll, upload and wait. All right. And this is the part where I use words right now to distract you from the fact that it takes a while for virus total to scan. So I'm instead going to use my words very carefully to distract you during the 15 to 20 seconds that it takes for virus total to scan this new binary. Now, of course, there are other strings that are considered malicious inside of Payload 64 because each vendor is going to essentially pick a random string that exists in that binary, but not other binaries. There's a lot more to AV than this, but this is just for the static signatures, but that's a lot of what they depend on. So if I search for Microsoft now, by the way, they say now undetected, just like we saw with Defender Check, it is a realistic test. All right. So whenever you're trying to distract the audience, while talking and you possibly need help from somebody else to help you distract the audience yeah. to fill time, do you find it helps to do lots of hand movements? It's true. I, I do. I think you're better about the hand movements than I am, but now that I'm trying to be extra gestury as I go, it's all the time I needed. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I think in this case, because I have hands on keyboard, I tend to be a little bit less gestury, which is probably bad on my part. But Let's compare the before and after. We went from 30 to 10 by getting rid of the name Tavis Ormandy. Is the PDB string with C users Tavis Ormandy actually malicious? Of course not. That's not how this works. But am I saying that 20 out of the 30 AV vendors that flagged Tavis Ormandy's tool were using the string Tavis Ormandy? Yes. That's exactly what I'm saying. So if you want to have very specific blame, you could definitely look at the list of before and after who marked it as bad before and does not mark it as bad afterwards. And there are many, of course, two thirds of the AV vendors were just flagging Tavis Ormandy, which is ridiculous. All right. So that's the other little bit I wanted to go over before we dive back in. All right. Amusingly, so I tweeted about this defender check against invoke mimicats, right? With changing one more string or three more strings, actually, right? Process memory, virtual protect, log on pass, and TVQ to TV plus Q. And I went down to 12 AV vendors flagged it before I tweeted about it. And then I tweeted about it, and three different AV vendors, Microsoft included, added new signatures, right? Because there's some disadvantages for it real security uh, professionals. I tend to talk about my bypass methods. There's a lot that I'm demonstrating here, but there's other stuff I'll refer to as we go, right? And if you tweet about your bypass, it tends to get attention because the, the market incentive, right, is to well, look legit, I mean, to at least block invoke dash mimicats as it originally comes from GitHub. But there's all sorts of ways we can uh, bypass that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this goes back to, wasn't it, didn't John mention talking about the coverage versus actual, I don't know, comprehensive blocking That's of attack, minor attack techniques, right? Yeah, that Same was yesterday. Idea. Dave was talking yeah, about that. Yesterday. Yep. So public tool sets, anything generated by Metasploit, Empire, Co Covenant, Veil vale Evasion, even Cobalt Strike to some extent, because look, AV vendors are going to find a way to get Cobalt Strike and such as well. If you use a, a public tool set, AV vendors spend a disproportionate amount of time making signatures for that because it's just too embarrassing that Metasploit makes it right by that AV vendor. Oh, which reminds me, here's oops, not, all right, here's some shell code straight out of MSF Venom. It turns out if you use your own template, this is bad. This is just a string of hex from MSF Venom directly. And then I allocate some memory with that shellcode, copy that shellcode into the memory space, and call it. So hopefully, Metasploit directly is, is going to be marked as bad, right? Because of what I've highlighted is literally directly from MSF Venom. But as it turns out, I think I have it now. I can upload again, whatever. I may have lost track of tabs, uh, but don't worry, I blame John Strand. Source, repos, shellcode, and there's my shellcode.c++, all right? 
Oh, I, I did add a comment since I last uploaded. So it will take another 30 seconds or so for it to be flagged or not, as it turns out. Because it, if you do anything yourself from scratch, this was compiled today using Visual Studio 2019 community, right? We stop and me cats. B. Molly, that I, I was there at RSA that year when they um, Carbon Black had up the big poster. We stop Mimi Cats, and then very amusingly, oh sorry, that's the the shell code. I need to give you the compiled binary. What? What did I do? Shellcode.exe, upload that one, and there you go. Nine out of seventy AV vendors. Now, am I giving all sorts of credit to those nine vendors? Look, I'm giving more than I am to the others. But this is embarrassing. This is directly from Metasploit. Just run this shellcode. But there aren't many strings available. There's not a whole lot of badness to flag upon because Metasploit does try very hard, right? Creds to Egypt and many others involved to obfuscate as much the, uh, the built-in uh, shellcode for uh, Meterpreter Stager, for example. All right? So using public tool sets, talking about your bypass methods, and uploading the virus tunnel. The th three things I'm doing in this talk you're now playing on hard mode. So try to avoid hard mode. And my absolute favorite method of bypass antivirus is to cheat, all right? I'm gonna talk more about bypass and AV because I think that's important for InfoSec professionals. But it turns out if you use legit software, all right, stuff that's marked as legit, signed by Microsoft, can you use non-malicious software in malicious ways? Yeah, of course. For the lateral movement, use PS exec, use remote desktop, for file transfers, remote desktop has their own file transfer method built in that a lot of people aren't monitoring for, right? Instead of uploading mimicats.exe or invoke dash mimicats to your victim client machine, dump LSAS on that remote machine using freaking task manager, right? Task manager details, go to the LSAS process, right click, create dump file, right? This is a built in functionality since Windows Vista. And this dump file has everything I need to extract password hashes and possibly passwords, because on the OS version, for all logged in users. But it's not going to be anybody blog, uh, flag uh, task manager as malicious? No, of course not. Right? Instead of using the built in like hash dump command, save out those registry highs. Anybody block reg save? The SAM is where uh, password hashes are stored inside of Windows, and they're encrypted using the system. Fred.exe. Ah, Darn you, Impacket. All right. And they're encrypted using keys also stored in the registry. All right. It's like storing your uh, uh, the key in the lock while it's locked. All right. Does anybody block this? No, but I now can bring sam.hive and system.hive back to my own machine and use plenty of utilities to extract out local password hashes from there. And that works just fine. All right. My initial C2 is almost never. Cobalt Strike or Metasploit or whatever. My initial C2 is come something like a Team Viewer or Remote Desktop or I don't know VMware Horizon, right? Something that gives legit access that isn't going to be flagged, and I can use more specialized tools from there. And I love, I love. I was looking up um, different AV vendors that have themselves been breached, and this was chat logs that happened to be saved from the people who originally allegedly hacked uh, Trend Micro. And they were selling access to the Trend Micro internal network. They said, you have unfettered access to their network environment. The access sold is via TeamViewer or any desk remote software because it's legit. And admins use it too. So there's no questions, which I think is hilarious to see actual threat actors talking about misusing legitimate software in malicious ways. Talk about... <clears throat> Offensive security tools, OST debate, right? My favorite remote access Trojan is psexec.exe or remote desktop because it's legit and it works for everything I need. All right. If you do have to fight, it's nice to make it a very unfair fight, right? So PowerShell with the introduction of Windows 10 supports AMZ, uh, but not PowerShell version 2. PowerShell version 2, which you can literally invoke PowerShell dash version 2 doesn't support AMSI. If you look at the built-in $PS version table, right? if you're running PowerShell version 2.0, there's no AMSI support here. So invoke dash mimicats all you want. And I have literally, uh, mimicat. There are multiple cats. And I have 
done stupid, stupid things that work just fine, like taking uh, uh, the source, I'm not going to go into it, uh, the source for invoke dash mimicats from GitHub, highlight all, and just paste inside of PowerShell version 2 window, and that works fine. Because a lot of people aren't monitoring copy paste, though I will add that a uh, new version of Sysmon does actually support uh, copying the, the clipboard, uh, which is amazing. I said that, uh, so I've, this is mostly for static detections and then the runtime with AMZ. You can also unhook API calls, right? Because they're running at the same privilege level as the thing observing you. So if there's a bot in your room monitoring you to make sure you don't do bad things, step one is spray paint over the eyes of the bot and then do the bad thing or pick up the bot and toss it out the room and then move on, right? Unhook those API calls or make direct system calls, syscalls, right? bypassing AV's hooks, right? You can also detect that emulated environment. So we're attacking each of the three major components. Detect the emulated environment because if it turns out, it's very different than a full Windows machine. I love this blog post because it, it gives you so many random things to work with. Talk about it's fuzzing and AV evasion all in one. I love it. What do they do? They call lots of functions, every single function on whatever DLL under C Windows 32 you point to, all right, here we have IPHLPAPI.dll. It turns out if you call the delete persistent TCP port reservation function with these two arguments, the built-in real legit version of that DLL will trample over a couple of registers. So if you call that as part of starting up your binary and then check those registers when you're done, you've just checked in a very unique way, is this real Windows or is this an emulated environment? And I love this is giving you an approach and a tool, not just here's the one technique, right? So you can also uh, encrypt the entire payload if you're trying to avoid these bad strings. I love the idea of Hyperion. Hyperion takes any arbitrary executable, AES encrypts it, AES-128, and it throws away a few of the bits, which is just beautiful. So when you start that Hyperion encoded binary, it then brute forces the last few bits of the AES key and then starts as normal, right? Nothing surprising here, except that, well, if it's AES encrypted, the binary on disk isn't going to have bad strings, right? Or statistically unlikely, at the very least. You're going to have random data or indistinguishable from random, right? I have another thing that I've done and I just love. This is my favorite approach because it's so stupid. I have here, uh, straight out of Metasploit, msfvenom.exe, right? It's flagged as ab.exe because Metasploit uses Apache Bench as the, uh, the template binary. And then I appended 10 megabytes of random data to the end of the binary, literally with DD. That's not how exes are supposed to have data uh, incorporated. Right, but the binary still works. Notice the detection rate goes down from 55 to 46. I continue this thought and go to 49 megabytes where we still have 46 vendors. Because I had an AV vendor in class who said, try 50. Just trust me, try 50. So I tried 50 megabytes and we have 43 vendors. So obviously they're one of those three vendors where if the binary size is over 50 megabytes, just go ahead and mark it as good, which is embarrassing, right? The actual binary is still like the 100 kilobytes or so directly from Metasploit. But there's a whole bunch of random data at the end. And well, if it's over 50 megabytes total, some media vendors say, eh, that looks hard. Can we just mark it as good and move on? So it's going to take too long to scan that. There's going to be lots of like little tiny strings in there. Let's just mark it as good and move on with our lives. Ugh. All right. So if I want to go kind of the upper bound of that, by the way, I did virus level supports 550 megabytes as the maximum file size. So I did 549 megabytes of random, and we're down to, what, 34 out of 64 vendors market as bad, and we have some fun ones to name and shame. By the, well, by the way, malware bytes, I don't know why they exist, because I, I try real hard, but I can't seem to get malware bytes to flag on any binary I upload, right? We have some trends in here. Silence, all right? Unable to process file type. It was too big, right? Semantic, I guess, timed out. This is, this is fun, right? So that's what the extra data is for. Adding new strings, same idea as well. All right, and if you do have to fight a fair fight, then 
try the fair fight ahead of time in an emulated environment, in a VM, essentially, right? This is the equivalent of it. If you have to fight, if I have to get in a physical confrontation, if I could like test it first and fight over and over, just like a save points in your average video game, right? Fight the boss, fail, reload, fight the boss, fail, reload. And when you have the approach figured out, then fight the boss and just flawlessly execute from start to finish. This is the same idea. Install the antivirus in an isolated vendor uh, virtual machine. So it doesn't report to the vendor, doesn't report to your client, doesn't have your client's endpoints to work off with, right? Update those AV signatures, then disconnect the network adapter because every AV vendor phones home some details about every suspicious process. Going back to Defender, this is way more than just Defender that does this, but we have automatic sample submission. Notice I very carefully disabled it via group policy because if something is suspicious, Defender's like, hey, let me just send the whole binary up to Microsoft so we can make better signatures for it. I don't want them to do that. Right? So disconnect the network adapter entirely. And we have a snapshot that we've taken, right? Because I totally have on screen the step to take a snapshot, right? You can all read that on screen right now. Come on, update. There we go. It definitely says to take a snapshot that you revert back to later. We all saw that it was there the whole time, and I may have to give an updated PDF. Anyway, all right, so take a snapshot, disconnect the network adapter, introduce that malware. If you're discovered, right, if it's flagged, modify the binary, repeat as necessary, and then no matter what, revert to snapshot. Because if you ever reconnect the virtual adapter, it will phone home, all right? All right, application control. I, I, I think I've phoned this point enough, but let me beat this dead horse even more. Antivirus has an impossible job. And I mean literally, then it's a literally an impossible job. Determining whether something is malicious or not is way harder than the halting problem. The halting problem was proved in 1936. Alan Turing, you may have heard of him, right? Said that you can't even figure out if a program with an input is going to finish running or run forever. Because even if you programmed it very carefully for that particular binary, then based on the input given, that binary can say, oh, this is the input, now I'm going to keep running forever, right? The halting problem is much easier than the is it malicious problem. So it is literally impossible because there are literally infinite ways to do Hello World or Meterpreter or Mimikatz or ransomware, whatever. So application control, formerly known as application whitelisting, yes. Uh, this is allowing some software that you use internally as well. I'm not saying allow all Microsoft signed binaries. I'm not saying allow all known vendor software, allow all internally developed application. But instead, reduce your attack surface from the infinite universe of possible programs to the ones that you at least already use, right? I'm far less concerned about accidentally whitelisting something than I am about allowing all binaries in the history of the universe over and over and over again. <laughs> this is slow, Jeff. <clears throat> I got excited, okay? And plus, I don't get to feed back out of the room and see John in the back going, slow down! All right. Even if you allow all Microsoft signed binaries and only signed Microsoft binaries, that's not 100% effective. As it turns out, there are lots of signed Microsoft binaries that allow you to run arbitrary code, right? Some of the more famous are installutil and msbuilds.exe, and a lot of pen testers and red teamers in the room will definitely re uh, pick up on that. Oh, I remember that one, right? Because you can run arbitrary C sharp. And let me remind you that MSFNM has output format of C sharp. So run the and, bad and remember, thing. And remember, Jeff, we have to, re we have to pronounce it regasm because that's how it's actually pronounced. We gasm? Oh, 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 reg, reg asm exe. Regasm. Ah! Yep, okay. I, now that I've finished regasming, I can move on and talk about this is living off the land binaries and scripts, or LOL BAS. These are commonly known. And there are a great list of uh, known app locker bypasses because by default, app locker allows you to run anything under C Windows. But is C Windows temp? allowed to edit by everyone? Yeah, absolutely. So I can make any new arbitrary binary I want inside of here and then run that inside. Ah, the sound bite is gonna come back and haunt me. All right, 
So better than just AV, rely on detective controls as well, right? Preventive controls are impossible at the 100% level, right? Plug your AV alerts in to the things that you're actually monitoring, your security operation centers that uh, Chris Crowley did a great talk on, by the way. Because I have, look, attackers screw up. Uh, Dave Kennedy did uh, last year's keynote as well, and he gave a quote that I've been quoting ever since, that top-tier attackers don't get caught by computers. But top-tier attackers can absolutely be caught by human eyeballs, right, looking in the right area. So I've screwed up. I'm not always a top-tier attacker. I have copied essentially Meterpreter.exe to, uh, as directly from Metasploit, directly to the sysvol share of a domain controller. And it was flagged as malicious, and it was removed. And I said, oh, crap, what did I just do? Right? Attackers screw up, and certainly I screw up a lot. But amusingly, at that client, nobody noticed. It was flagged as malicious. It was removed. And therefore, we have to stop there. Right? It's, it's good to go. Obviously, it's not concerning that someone was able to write to an administrative share of a domain controller on our primary domain. That's not Wait, no, of course that's problematic, right? So react quickly, including that root cause analysis. And Egypt rightly points out, the human IDS is absolutely very, very tough to beat, but not impossible. Look up last year's talk with Dave Kennedy, and maybe someone can uh, show the link in the Discord channel here. But he talks very carefully about, if you know you're going to be observed, you, some, something you have to do to accomplish your goal that you know is going to be observed, you have two real approaches. One is to consider that particular C2, all of the stuff associated with that machine, burned, and just move on with less abilities from there. The other, and you can combine them, I suppose, is to carefully construct your technique such that when the tier one SOC analyst Googles for what you just did, it will look pretty legit. They'll mark it as a false positive, maybe even add a new signature saying this is never going to bother us again and move on with their lives. You have to trick the human eyeball or the brain behind it at that point. And I do have to point out the Gartner Magic Quadrant, the upper right, right, the leader is Microsoft. Now, I will say anecdotally, Windows Defender is absolutely the toughest to bypass for reliably. However, AV is still fundamentally a broken industry and they have a strong financial incentive to convince you otherwise. So application control, great. AV and EDR, look, my favorite EDR is Sysmon because endpoint detection, detection is the important word there. Sysmon plus things like, oh, we actually have here, right? Olaf Hartong, yes, he's typing now in Discord, who has done some great work putting together Sysmon rules and alerts based on it. And that is amazing. That is powerful. My absolute favorite signature is not, this is known bad. My absolute favorite type of signature is, this is suspicious and unusual and worthy of further investigation. Does Rita, does the active countermeasures uh, paid version, that does a whole lot more, to be clear, of Rita flag known malicious binaries? No, it looks for suspicious behavior. And if you want to hear John Strand rants, just say something like, um, oh, I had so many false positives with Rita. No, you didn't have any false positives. You had beaconing behavior that was associated with legit software. But that's probably something you should know about anyway. And by the way, as John says, stop all of the ads. You're going to get so many ad networks rotating every 30 seconds or whatever. But yes, sysmon module is the repo I was thinking of. Thank you, George. Appreciate that. But yes, application control is great actual detective controls via things like Sysmon, and then check the box with Windows Defender, or now Microsoft Defender for Endpoint Detection Analytics, whatever they call it nowadays. They literally changed the name for most of the Defender suite yesterday. All right. And by the way, AV is not just a clear win to install. AV has its own attack surface, of course. Right. And this has resulted in issues over time with people using AV for privilege escalation itself, which I find hilarious. I have two processes that I will usually migrate to in using things like Metasploit, by the way. My first personal favorite is the print spooling service, because I'm usually operating on servers. And if 
it's a server and it's not a print server. You pretty much never print there, but it runs the system, runs as the native architecture, 32-bit, 64-bit, whatever. Oh, and by the way, if it crashes, it doesn't really matter. But my second favorite is to migrate to the antivirus process itself because it feels awfully fun to just kind of close you up next to antivirus, say, hey, buddy, what's up? Don't mind me, I'm just going to do all these bad things. And taking actions over the network as an AV like scanning or Nessus or Qualys scanning account, because the SOC will look at that and say, huh, that's weird. Qualys touched every endpoint. Oh, wait, that's not weird because Qualys we have set to scan the entire environment once a week. Somebody must have done an extra scan and just ignore it entirely. But yes, AV does have its own problems that it introduces as well. Closing statement, and I, I love this. This is in almost every one of my executive summaries. Suitable for high level. To prevent successful breaches, because again, initial compromise is inevitable. This is why we do assume breach tests. To prevent successful breaches, right, end-to-end -end attacks, defenders need to detect and respond to attackers between that initial compromise time and them accomplishing their goal. So you have a timeline, and you have two goals, therefore. Lower the time it takes you, the defender, to detect and respond to the attacker, as well as make it take longer for the attacker to accomplish their goal. If the attacker has, as we've all found many times, two or three or four or five or ten different ways to gain domain admin in less than a half hour, get the stuff and exfiltrate the stuff, or ransom your environment, delete all backups, if they can do that in an hour, you have a really tough time with detective controls because your SOC's not going to reliably react that quickly before the attacker has moved above and beyond. There's been some great posts and write-ups on honeypot environments or honey net environments where the attacker went through and uh, what did they do? In, in less than a half hour from the original endpoint, had gathered additional credentials, maybe to reuse local administrator password, use laps, and moved on to other places. And I've dealt with incident response where this exact thing has happened as well. And the, uh, the defenders re-imaged the box, but the attacker had already moved on. That's where that root cause analysis comes in. So prevention is ideal, right? And the, the quote used to be, prevention is ideal, but detection is a must. And here's the new quote. Prevention is ideal, but it's literally impossible to prevent 100% of incidents. So focus on minimizing, yes, but then detecting and accelerating your response to incidents. All right, so everything you just saw is online as of now by that same link I shared, bit.ly slash bypass AV. If you have any follow-up questions while well, I'm in Discord as of right now, we have five minutes left if John doesn't take that time for me. And that, that, that's, that's about it. Well, that was enough. <laughs> oh, crap. Well played, sir. Well played. I tried to fit as many words as possible in because I think that's exactly what equals value, right? More you words. Did. You did good, Jeff. You did. Thank good. you. So, so do we have any questions for Jeff in the next few minutes? Uh, I just have a real quick reminder for all the organizers. We had a turnover. Just make sure if you need to leave, you do not end the webinar. You leave the webinar. That goes for everybody. You leave the webinar. You do not end the webinar. Thank you. Bye. Do you want me to end the webinar for all? Is that what you said? Yes. <laughs> Speed it up a bit. Thank you, Egypt. Thank you, Opio. Thank you for 15 minute talks, right? So I'll, I'll yield my time back to the strands of the world. I'll be in Discord. <laughs> all right. We'll see you, Jeff. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And you can find Jeff always lurking on Discord. <laughs> oh, and here's me sucking at capitalism. I also consult. So if you want to consult, I'm here too. That's that's the, the advertising we're done. <laughs> so wait, 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 wait. wait. Oh, Jeff, he's gone. Oh, Do man, he's, he's worse at capitalism than we are. No, he's he back. Is. We're good. Oh, he's yeah, wait. Wait. there he is. So Jeff, if people wanted to, uh, okay, so there you go. You got Road Valley InfoSec, and that email is the best email for them to get a hold of you? Yep, that's fine. And Discord. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, Discord. Feel free to reach out to me on direct message on Discord, because that's how lead generation works if you suck at capitalism the way I do, and you certainly do as well. Sounds good. All right, man, we'll see you. Thank you.